In Genesis chapter 11, a story that's probably familiar to you, it's not unfamiliar to you, what we'll see is that the people rejected the express will of God to follow their own heart's desire, bringing the judgment of God upon them. Are we strong enough or how can we be strong enough to resist the temptation to follow our own heart's desire, even as believers? When something seems to be more convenient that I want to do than what God has commanded me to do, then the temptation is to follow my heart's desire instead of doing what I've been asked to do. How do we resist that temptation? How do we stand against that? How do we, how do we stop achieving self-actualization? If you've been to any kind of studies, you've probably seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs and self-actualization. In other words, doing exactly what you want to do is the height of the self-actualization. The problem is Jeremiah told us that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. So if you leave me to my own heart to do what my own heart wants to do, it's going to be deceitfully wicked. So the temptation is, how can I resist that when, when it seems convenient to do what I want to do, but God has asked me to do something different? How do I stand against that? In the text here, the flood that we know, Noah and the ark, the flood, the flood has already happened. And it was a worldwide flood. It wasn't just a local flood. It was a worldwide flood, the Bible says, and it covered all of the mountains of the earth. Now, you have to think about this a little differently. The topography that we understand today is not the same as it was before the flood. When the great depths of the earth were broken open and all the water came up, it changed the topography of the earth. So it wasn't the same. And the water, we were told, Noah said, that it covered all the way up to the top of the mountains, above the top of the mountains. This worldwide flood has already happened. It's about the sixth generation since the flood, about 150 years after the flood. So not long after the flood. This is where we come to and find ourselves in Genesis chapter 11. So let's start reading in verse number one of Genesis chapter 11. If you have your Bible or your device, follow along with me. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. So everyone spoke the same language and everyone understood each other. As the people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone. There wasn't any, any stone in that area that they're going to build. So they make bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Why? What was their fear? Lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. That was their fear. Their fear was that they would be spread upon the whole earth. So they congregate in one location, in one city, and they begin building this tower. So here we see that they all spoke the same language. This phrase, one people, is used to demonstrate the truth that all mankind descended from Noah and Adam. First from Adam and then through Noah, because Noah, his family, the only eight that survived the flood, and from them came the rest of mankind. So this one language shows that we have a common, a common denominator of a first pair and then through Noah and his family. It says that they migrated from the east. This idea of an eastward migration, or in the Bible when it talks about migrating from the east or an eastward migration, it has the idea of separation in the Bible. So every time you see this idea of migration from the east or an eastward movement, it has the idea of separation in the Bible. In Genesis 4.16, here's an example of a separation that took place. Then Cain, after he had killed his brother, then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod east of Eden. So this idea of going eastward of Eden, this idea of a separation. So they're separating themselves from something is the idea here. Now the fact that the people settled, it says that they settled in the land of Shinar. This is in direct opposition to the Lord's expressed will for his people after the flood. But they said, no, let's gather together because we don't want to be dispersed on the face of this earth. So let's gather together in one city and then let's build us this tower that we're going to make a name for ourselves. In other words, all people are going to think about is us, not the creator. Genesis 9.1 is this direct will of God for his people after the flood. Genesis 9.1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and Fill the earth. 
spread out on the face of the earth. That's what their fear was. They did not want to be dispersed upon the face of the earth. So they congregated in one location and decided to make a name for themselves through this leader that we're going to be introduced to in a little bit. So the mandate after the flood is the root of the people's disobedience. God had his expressed will. Be fruitful and multiply. Spread yourself on the face of the earth. But they said, no, no, we don't want to be dispersed upon the face of the earth. We want to congregate together. I, I don't know if you ever thought about it. The command was be fruitful and multiply, both to Adam and Eve and then both to Noah and his family. Be fruitful and multiply. And how many times we hear, we have too many humans already on the earth. We need to get rid of humans already as we have. We have too many people on the earth right now. So to be fruitful and multiply, that seems like a really dumb thing to do. Let me ask you a question. The God who gave the command, be fruitful and multiply, don't you think he'd figure out a way how to bless us if we were obedient to his command? Makes sense to me. So the tower stands on the plains of Shinar. It's a location, specific location. A good word study, if you ever want to have fun to do a word study in the Bible, look at the word Shinar and the location of Shinar and all the things associated with the land and the plain of Shinar. It has this idea, basically, uh, this idea of, um, uh, of that which is in opposition to God. And the tower stood on the plains of Shinar and it was standing as their sign of the unity of the human race. There's nothing sinful in building a tower. That's not the problem. There's nothing sinful in building a city. That is not the problem. The problem is God had given them a specific command to be fruitful and multiply and spread yourself on the face of the earth. But they're not willing to do that. Lest they be dispersed, they gather together and then try to make a name for themselves. So the tower in the city, there's nothing wrong with that. It was the motivation behind building the tower. Their motivation was wrong. You know, I don't know if you thought about that. You and I, even as believers, we can do the right thing with the wrong motivation. The right thing with the wrong motivation. I'm going to read my Bible so God will love me more. No, God loves you perfectly now. He's not going to love you more if you read your Bible. Now, should you read your Bible? Absolutely. It's the right thing to do. But it's not the motivation that God's going to love me more. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to have my devotion daily. I'm going to come to church all the time. And that way God will love me more. That's the wrong motivation. God loves you with a perfect love. It will never change. Even when I am naughty, God loves me. I don't like being naughty, but even when I am, he loves me. So we have to be careful of the motivation of why we do certain things. The motives of the tower builders are as evil as their predecessors who desired power before the flood came. There was this, this, this evil working. They desired power before the flood. Now, after the flood, you have a whole new group of people that have the same idea as the ones prior to the flood. In fact, let me introduce you to a man who ran everything at this time. In Genesis chapter 10, verse 8 through 10, it says this. Cush followed, uh, fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was the man on earth, okay? The man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, that's talk, not talking about deer hunting or moose hunting or bear hunting. It has the idea of capturing human souls, taking them captive. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom, so he's a king, beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalne, in the land of Shinar. Interesting, huh? So Nimrod's desire was to establish a world empire, a one world government. Nimrod's name means, let us revolt. That's what his name means, let us revolt. So his desire was not to follow the will of the Lord and, and have people disperse out, but his desire was to gather them all together so he could reign over them as a world leader in a one world government. And he and his wife, Nimrod and his wife, devised a new kind of religion that was practiced there and it's been practiced in multiple different forms ever since. It's the religion built around the mother and the child. You'll see it all over the place. Different names, different countries, same thing, the mother and the child. Ron Hutchcraft wrote, the tower might, has might as well have been in the shape of a raised, clenched fist. They were saying, we're going to be the stars here. 
We want to be important. So we're going to build something that will show everybody, even God, how really important we are. See, that's their motivation. That's the reason that they were doing this. They believed the tower at Babel was, was conceived as a stairway that will allow them into the heavens so they would have divine prerogative in the heavens. Do you see what mankind is trying to do? He's elevating himself above his creator. Genesis 28, 12, this idea of this, 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 this uh, realm of the divine, when Jacob had this dream, he dreamed and behold, there was a ladder set upon the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. It became the, the access to the, divine of the, realm, uh, the realm of the divine and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on us. So they thought they could create this, this stairway to the, to, the, to, the, to the realm of the divine where they could be the divine. So they're, ex they're ignoring God's expressed will for his people, for mankind. The people had done what seemed convenient instead of what was commanded. Oh boy, there is a danger there. There's a real danger there. There's a danger that you and I, even as believers, can take the convenient route and not the command route where, oh Lord, are you sure you got this right? You really don't know my situation as well as I do. It seems like it'd be better if I did this. And God's going, no, I'm asking you to do this. Yeah, but it's convenient for me to do. It's even the danger that you and I can run into is listening to convenience over commands. We can fall into the same trap. Sometimes, even when I say this, it sounds silly. Sometimes we actually believe we're wiser than God. I mean, think about it. It's a, it's, it sounds hilarious. You should laugh when I say that statement because it sounds so funny, but it's true. Sometimes we think we're wiser than God. They certainly did. So mankind's chief goal had shifted from glorifying God and enjoying him forever to promoting their own selfishness. Self-promotion. Self-promotion. That is the air that you and I breathe in the Western world. That's really what it's all about, self-promotion. It's about self. Promoting self. God has been forgotten in most of the Western countries. We seem to be solidified around how wise and creative and, and, and intellectual man is. We don't need a God any longer. Sometimes self-promotion is a problem for us as well. You've seen it. You've been at work before. You know those kind of people that have their elbows wide trying to knock everyone else off the ladder as they're climbing up the ladder. They don't care about anyone else. Self-promotion seems to be the air we breathe. So we need to ask ourselves some probing questions at times. For example, am I purchasing this item or seeking this promotion or performing this service so that I might feel better about myself or attract attention to myself? Or am I doing it for the glory of God? What's my motivation? Am I doing it to promote myself or am I doing it for the glory of God? Paul told the Corinthians a universal principle. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Love your spouse to the glory of God. Raise your children to the glory of God. Serve in your community for the glory. Everything, it's a universal principle. Everything we do should be for the glory of God, not for self-promotion like them. The people want to empower themselves by creating a name for themselves, something that would be lasting when they die. Oh yeah, I remember that people. They made that tower. How the name was achieved, it was for themselves. It wasn't for the glory of God. They did it, the text says, for themselves, not for God. See, they attempted to gain by human effort that which only God can give, heaven. We can achieve heaven by our own effort. We can work our way to the realm of the divine. We can do it ourselves. Boy, that same is true today. When we talk about... For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him has eternal life. We would rather do it ourselves, wouldn't we, as humans? We would rather, well, I can do this and I, I, I won't kick my dog and I'll be nice to my spouse and I won't yell at my children. Look, God, I'm a really good person. I can win your favor by what I do. We do it the same as human beings today. We try to earn God's favor by what we do. Whereas he says we are to come by faith alone in Jesus Christ for salvation, apart from any works that we can do. It's a danger even today for people in this world thinking that they can achieve the realm of the divine by their own works. That's not what God, that's not what God has commanded. Passage we all know well, Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith. 
And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one might boast. It makes perfect sense. If I did something really great more than you, look how great I am. We could be boasting about all the things we did to earn to the realm of the divine. Works so that no one may boast. 